Good evening. Over the, the last few couple of months, I guess we could say, uh, on Sunday evenings, we've been looking at a series of lessons on sin, um, you know, the things that can lead us into sin, and, and part of that has kind of been focused on some of the lies uh, that Satan tells us about sin. We've looked at some things that, you know, Satan will tell us, you know, sin is really not that bad, sin is really not that big of a problem. Um, that's not really sin, uh, and so on and so forth. We could go, and, and I think another one of the lies that Satan tells us is you may have sin in your life, but it's really not that urgent that you get rid of it. Um, you have your whole life ahead of you, and so you've got plenty of time in your life to get rid of those things after you've kind of lived your life a little bit. Um, and I think this is probably a lie that he tells, especially to our young people, he tells it to all of us, but I think he tells it especially to our young people, you know, you've got your whole life in front of you, you don't have to get rid of those things because you've got all the time in the world. But the question that I ask is, do you? Do you have all the time in the world? So that's what we want to talk about tonight, is this sense of urgency in getting rid of sin. And when we talk, talk about urgency, we're just uh, talking about something that is uh, of such a great importance that it requires swift action. You've got to take action right now. Or it's, it's a force or an impulse that really impels us or constrains us to take care of it, uh, whatever it is. You know, we need to take care of it. Um, and, you know, you think about it, what are the, some of the things or the situations in our lives where we generally feel the most urgency? Um, you know, and it's usually those things that need to be dealt with on the short term. Um, you know, sometimes with, with long-term goals and preparations, we seem to think that we have all the time in the world to complete those things. And of course, our ultimate long-term goal is what? It's when we lead this life, we wanna be with God. That's our long-term goal. And so I think sometimes we have a lack of sense of, ur of urgency. And you think about you know, some other examples that are not necessarily religious related, but you know, for those of you who are students, you know, at the beginning of the semester, your, your, uh, your professor tells you, okay, you're going to have a term paper due at the end of the semester. How many of you get busy right then working on that term paper? <laughs> or you go on throughout your semester and then all of a sudden it's the last week of the semester and you haven't started on that term paper yet. Or, you know, for parents, I know this has happened to us. You know, saving for our child's college education. When they're, they're born, you know, we've got to start saving for college, and we'll get to that, we'll get to that. And then they're 10 years old, oh, we'll get to that. Then they're 15, we'll get to that. And then they're, it's time to go to college, we don't have any money saved. Because there was no sense of urgency. You know, for those of us who are in the workforce, saving towards our retirement, <laughs> you know, sometimes we put those things off, or, if, uh, you know, if you're, a, if you're an RN case manager, you can think, oh, well, you know, I've got quarterlies due, but they're not due till the end of the month, and then all of a sudden it's the last week of the month, and you haven't started on them yet, okay? Because there's not that sense of urgency. So too often our long-term goals creep up on us, and we find ourselves unprepared. And spiritually, this can happen to us too because we can, you know, think I've got all the time in the world to put off repentance and getting rid of sin because I've got lots of time. But again, I ask, do we? Do we have lots of time? Brethren, let me tell you something. I'm 52 years old. Yesterday I was 30. And the day before that, I was 20. Time gets away from us. We've got to plan, especially 
for our spiritual welfare. So we want to look tonight at the urgency of obedience and the urgency of putting away sin because the scripture is very clear about the urgency of being obedient to God. If you'll turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to begin in verse 1. Paul here says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, we read that, but we really kind of need the context. Because that's the beginning of a chapter. So in chapter 5, Paul was urging the church in Corinth to be reconciled to God. And if you know anything about the church in Corinth, you know they had a lot of problems. They had a lot of things that they needed to take care of. And what he's, he's addressing specifically here is the fact that they had false teachers among them. And he was encouraging them as he says in verse uh, chapter 1 verse 6 or ch chapter 6 verse 1 don't have received the grace of God in vain by following these false teachers and so how does he describe then the urgency of making sure they were right with God he said today is the day of salvation don't wait till tomorrow to get yourselves right. It's today because tomorrow or sometime in the distant future is not guaranteed. How about, how about James chapter 4 and verse 14? Over in the book of James, this is a, a passage that we're probably more familiar with when it comes to the urgency of things. But I'm going to begin in verse 13 where he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Again, James is in the context warning against making big plans, and being really self-assured about those plans. But what he tells us in, these, in this, these verses, he tells us whose hands our future is in. My future is not in my hands. My future is in the hands of God. And it's God alone who holds the answer of whether or not there will be a tomorrow or whether or not I will have a tomorrow to be able to accomplish those things that need to be done. And so this should also be our attitude towards obedience and putting away sin. We're not guaranteed tomorrow because tomorrow our lives may have vanished like that vapor or that smoke that James was talking about. And, you know, I can't help but think, and I'm sure everybody in this room has stories like this. But I remember when I was in high school, I would say that at least every year I was in high school, we lost one of our classmates. Do you think on the day that that young person lost their life, they expected that to be the last day of their life? They had the whole, their whole future in front of them. They didn't expect that, but they weren't guaranteed the next day. Or you think about, you know, other people that you know, just very recently, someone that I only kind of know through, uh, through online relationship, but he was out riding his motorcycle, something he loved to do. And through no fault of his own, someone ran over him on that motorcycle. And his life was over just like that. Do you think that he expected on that day that he took off on that Harley? 
that he thought that would be his last day. So is there some urgency in making sure our lives are right with God, no matter whether we're 16, 25, 55, or 85? There is an urgency in making sure that we're right with God. A couple of passages, and we won't take the, uh, well, we will take the time to read them, actually. Let's go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. And verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. We're going to read two passages that are very similar. But in 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, Peter says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And then if you go back a couple of, uh, of books to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul here talks about something very similar. He says in verse 2, For you, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So both of these passages speak of the coming of the day of the Lord. They're, they're talking about the coming of judgment. Now what does Peter tell us about the coming of the day of the Lord? He tells us that it will come like a thief in the night. That is, we don't know when it's coming. I don't know of, of one thief that is going to text me on my phone or call me or stop by earlier in the day and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to stop by your house tonight and I'm going to rob you. The idea here is we don't know when the thief is coming, just like we don't know when judgment is coming. But Paul says there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that those who are unprepared for the coming of the day of the Lord are going to be saying peace and prosperity. They're not going to they're not going to have a clue. And it reminded me of an old song that we used to sing. We don't sing it very much anymore. But a lot of you will remember this song time enough yet. And I'm just going to read the verses here. It says, O soul of mine, be not alarmed at what the Lord may say. Some future time when I'm old, I'll choose the heavenly way and put it off a little while till I'm old. I'm strong enough. I don't need no help. It's pleasure that I crave. When I've drunk life's sparkling cup, I'll call on Christ to save. The Holy Spirit's tender voice entreats me night and day, and ere I go and sin too far, I'll turn and him obey. Today, O oh friend, may be the last. Stop now and count the cost. You stand condemned before the throne, your soul forever lost. Time, time, time enough yet, O oh soul, why be alarmed? The heavenly way I'll choose someday, but there's time. Time enough yet, but then there's a second chorus to that song. And it reads like this Lost, lost, oh, what a cry from souls along the shore. In darkness to go, in sorrow and woe, and be lost, lost evermore. That second chorus is the answer of those who thought they had enough time. It's those, it's the answer of those who don't see the urgency of getting rid of sin and getting right with God right now, rather than saying, I have plenty of time. And you think about some of the first century converts that we see in Acts, how urgent did they consider it to be to get themselves right with Christ right now. You think on, on the day of Pentecost on, in Acts chapter 2, 
In verse 37, after Peter had finished, what did they say? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And you can probably tack on to that right now. They knew they were in dire straits, and they wanted it finished. They wanted it taken care of right now. And over in Acts, the 8th chapter, when Simon tried to buy the power to lay his hands on people so that they could accept the Holy Spirit or receive the Holy Spirit, Peter admonished Simon, you need to repent right now. And Simon begged Peter to pray for him right now. Get me right with God. Help me get right with God right now. The last part of Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch, when he finally understood about Jesus and salvation, he didn't wait till he got back home to take care of things. He said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? In Acts chapter 10, we see that after Cornelius and his household understood the gospel, it says he and his household were baptized immediately. And the Philippian jailer, in Acts chapter 16, again after hearing the gospel, said he and his household were baptized that same hour of the night. I have a quote here from the book about these conversions. And it says that the lesson from this is that when we need to do something to make our lives right with God, we need to do it right away. So what happens? What happens if we do put it off? What's the peril of having a lack of urgency to make ourselves right with God? Jesus provided two parables that show us what happens when we don't have the proper sense of urgency. And one of them is, is the one that uh, Brother Curtis read for us tonight, and one that we actually studied this morning in our Bible class. In Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 20, the parable of the rich fool. Because what we see is a man who was focused on the short-term issues of life. And again, just like I was asking a few minutes ago, do you think this man ever imagined that that was his last day on earth? When God said, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you, and whose will be all that you have left behind? I don't think he, he ever imagined that his life would end so quickly. God condemned him for being not, not being rich toward God, not having his life right with God, putting the things of this life ahead of getting his life right with God. He focused on the short-term goals and didn't place any urgency on the long-term goal of going to heaven. And over in Matthew chapter 25, another parable of Jesus, and it's again a, a parable that we all know. It's the parable of the foolish virgin, the wise and foolish virgins. And we know that you know there were there were five who were who were wise. They were all ten waiting for the bridegroom. Five were wise and, and had enough oil. Five were foolish and didn't have enough. And we might even say that, you know, all ten of these women, they were initially obedient. They were, they prepared themselves, but the five foolish virgins didn't look far enough ahead. They didn't keep themselves prepared. They kind of lost focus along the way. And this kind of teaches us another lesson, you know, that life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we can't let ourselves get distracted by the scenery along the way. But, you know, just like these foolish virgins, 
None of us know when we're going to reach the finish line. My finish line may come before all of yours. Yours may come before mine. We just don't know. So our focus always has to be on the coming of the bridegroom, on the coming of Jesus, no matter how long he delays. The fact of the matter is, we may all die before Jesus comes again. I hope not. But we may all die before Jesus comes again. But we need to be ready. We need to have a sense of urgency about making sure that we are ready. And so both of these parables then reinforce the idea. We don't know when the end is coming, so we need to always be prepared. We need to understand the urgency of obedience, the urgency of repentance when we fall short. I needed this. I don't know about the rest of you all. But I'm, I, you know, I kind of, Janice and I have plans, the things that we're planning for that are, quote, long-term plans, but they are not the long-term plan. And sometimes we let ourselves get distracted by those things. And, you know, I've got retirement coming up in a couple of years, and I'm looking forward to that, but that's not my long-term plan. My long-term plan is to be in heaven. And I think we can all say that we get distracted by things that are short-term and things that we may think of as long-term, but they are not the long-term plan. We need to have our, our retirement plan needs to be to retire at the feet of Jesus. And so we need to have a sense of urgency about making sure that we're ready because we don't know when our retirement day is coming. So, just some you know food for thought. Um, there may be a couple more lessons on in this series, but um, I'm kind of getting tired of it, and I'm sure you kind of are too. So uh, we will probably wrap it up, wrap this up in the next uh, couple of lessons and and move on to something else. But uh, appreciate so much the the kind attention tonight. And we never want to leave without uh, uh, offering the invitation to anyone who may be subject to it. So if you're here tonight, you're not a Christian, and you are uh, ready to obey. If you're ready, stop putting off um, oh, being obedient to Christ and putting on Christ in baptism. We can help you with that tonight. Or if you're a brother or sister who's struggling with sin, don't put it off. Don't put off getting help for it. Don't wait because tonight is New Year's Eve. Don't wait till midnight. <laughs> Don't wait for the new year to get yourself right with God. Do it now because today is the day of salvation. If you have any need whatsoever to respond to the invitation, we leave it open for you. Please let, let us know how we can help you as we stand and sing.